implies then that realization. Dude, what do you do when you discover that the individual that you're with, you can't be with or you shouldn't be with, right? The Greeks, of course, looked down on incest. A little bit different from the Egyptians, as we know, right? The Egyptians kept their gene pool sometimes within their, within their families, which is why oftentimes those gene pools didn't last for long, as we know, and those dynasties went out, right? But for the Greeks, incest, major no-no, major taboo. So in other words, the worst imaginable things Oedipus could do, A, he kills his father. That's a terrible thing. If Orestes killing his mother in the Oresteia trilogy is bad, killing your father's even worse, right? Remember how the Furies ends with Apollo making the observation that the true parent is actually the father, not the mother. Go back to those lectures. To, to catch up on that idea, right? So Oedipus does the unthinkable first by killing his father, but then to turn around and marry his mother and then to have children with his mother, which means what? Well, you hand on, of course, the curse, don't you? It's not, I mean, how are those kids, at the end of this play, how are those kids going to be able to live and deal with the fact that their mother and father were, oh, don't even get started. See how this works, right? So all of that is standing behind this play. Now, what makes this play genius? Well, let's put it in our notes this way. Everyone watching this play, and now you included as you're going to study this play with me, you know how this thing's going to end. Everybody knows. There isn't any question about, gee, I wonder how this thing's going to end up. No, 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 no. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what Oedipus has done. The genius for Sophocles is how we, the audience, get to watch Oedipus discover discover the truth. It's in that process that, of course, we're going to come to our notion of irony. So let's write that one down. On stage, dramatic irony, where one character says something and the audience recognizes, oh my word, this is brutal because, again, it's so ironic, the character doesn't understand really what it is that he or she is saying. And we're going to see a lot of that in this play. Sophocles is genius at this. Of course, we'll say it now before we even get to level three, this play is going to resurrect all kinds of questions about actions. How do you know the actions that you commit don't have negative repercussions in 20 years? How do you know that? This play says, no way you can know that. Well, then the obvious follow-up question is, well, then how do I ever know that I can ever act with any level of confidence in the things that I do? Because, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, like that bad country song, right? Same gig here. In fact, the Greeks invented this idea, and as we, as we study this play, we're going to see all kinds of levels of irony. However, in the end, if you begin to actually study this play closely at level three, this play will be maybe one of the more disturbing plays that you've ever studied. Not because a guy kills his dad and marries his mom and has kids with her. No, 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 no. That is disturbing. But that's not why this play is going to be disturbing to you. It's rather the implications. And this was the reason the play was so great for the, for the Greeks as well. Because of the implications of what it means to commit an act. And the ripple effect, both for yourself and for those around you, especially those you love. Well, let's go ahead now and turn, enough introduction, let's go ahead now and turn to the play itself. Um, and all I want to do now is just work through at level one with you, okay, really quickly, some of the language of the play. Um, and so here we go. I'm working again with the text out of the Harvard Classics. The opening lines of the play, Oedipus comes on stage, there is the chorus, and he says, Why sit ye here, my children? It's ironic that he calls the citizens of Thebes his children. Brood, last reared of Cadmus, famed of old, and solemn state uplifting in your hands, the supplants bows. In other words, he asks the simple question, why are you so upset? They, of course, respond by saying, well, there's a plague that has hit Thebes, and it is terrible for us. And in fact, the chorus will respond, God sends forth his darts of fire and lays us low, reminding us, for example, the opening of the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, where Apollo is sitting up on Mount Olympus shooting his darts into soldiers, right? The plague, he's, uh, the chorus says, abhorred and feared makes desolate uh, the home where Cadmus dwelt. Cadmus is the original king, right? It is not that we count thee uh, as a god equaled with them in power that we sit here, these little ones and I as supplants prone. Uh, in other words, you're, we, we recognize you're not a god, but you're pretty close to it. 
they finish by saying, come, save our city, look on us in fear, um, save us, save our city. Omens good were then with thee, thou didst thy work, and now be equal to thyself. If thou wilt rule as thou dost rule this land wherein we dwell, were better far to reign or living men than or around this people. In other words, the only way you can be a really good king is to have subjects and they got to all be alive and we're all dying of the plague. Can you please figure this out? Um, and, uh, and, and immediately Oedipus will say, it's, this is not a problem, not a problem. I've sent Creon, uh, my, my wife's brother, uh, Jacusta's brother, I've sent Creon um, to the oracle, and the oracle is going to tell us how we can solve our problem. And sure enough, Creon comes back. Creon, right away, the very first thing he says is, our evil plight, if all goes well, may end in highest good. This is, of course, going to be dark irony. Creon will be one of the last people to speak in this play, and by the end of the play, it's Creon who is king because Oedipus will have discovered all the tragedies of his life. We will then have an exchange between Oedipus and Creon, where for the first time it appears, Oedipus is ready to ask about the murder of Laius. About why? Well, Creon says it. The oracle says the reason why the plague is hit Thebes is because the murder of Laius, some possibly 20 years ago, okay, um, the murder of Laius uh, has not been found, and he's living in Thebes unknown. And to that degree, we've got to find him. It's at that point Oedipus begins to have a conversation with Creon, which is quite fascinating. Oedipus says, hey, about the death of Laius, was it at home or in the field or else in some strange land that Laius met his doom? Which is a strange thing, because it appears that. Now, the irony here is really kind of interestingly overlaid, right? It appears that Oedipus has never actually asked these questions. So, wait a minute, I got to be king of Thebes, that is right. And the old king of Thebes was a guy named Laius, that is right. Well, where is Laius? Ah, he's dead. Oh, that's too bad. And for 20 years, he never asked, ever asked about this guy? Like, okay, well, like, died how? Like, died how? Like, where, in a field or at home? Or like, what, did he have a bad illness or something? Creon says, he went, so spake he, pilgrim-wise afar, and never more came back, as forth he went. In other words, he left and he never came back. He was going on a pilgrimage and he never, and he never came back, right? Um, uh, Oedipus says, was there no courier? None who shared his road, from whom inquiry one might learn the truth? Creon says, dead are they all, save one, who fled for fear. And he had naught to tell but this. And then all of a sudden he's ready to tell the story, and Sophocles tells us that Oedipus is going to interrupt him, and he says, and what was that? One fact might teach us much, had we but one small starting point of hope, the irony. Oedipus is totally into these, like, dude, I know. We're going to find out who killed Laius. All I need is just one fact. Give me one fact to start a chain of events that will lead us back to the original, original you know, answer of who killed Laius, and then, dark irony, we can have some hope. Creon says that the one guy who got away used to tell that robbers fell on him. Not man for man, but with outnumbering force. In other words, uh, we were attacked by a whole bunch of people. Robbers. Note the plural. It will be Oedipus. And the genius of this play, and this is why I'm spending the time with you in a line-by-line -line reading, the genius of this play is that Sophocles will have Oedipus say something that's quite revelatory. Look what Oedipus says. Yet sure, no robber would have dared this deed. Oedipus takes the number from plural to singular. It's almost as if somehow Sophocles wants the audience to realize that at the deep psychological level, Freud will certainly go there. We'll talk more about it later. At the deep psychological level, Oedipus somehow already understands one person killed Laius, one person killed all those other guys that he was with. I wonder who that one robber was. He says, no robber would have dared this deed unless some bribe had tempted him from hence. For Oedipus, it's always about motivations. Why would anybody want to kill the king? Had to have been a bribe. Had to have been somebody was trying to get into the kingdom itself. And of course, the implication could be quickly made. Well, if Laius was killed and immediately Oedipus became king, did he have anything to do with it? That's going to stand behind much of the line of questioning here that will follow. 
especially as Oedipus gets first really mad at the blind prophet Tiresias, and then later Creon himself, right? Um, finally, we're going to get this notion of um, Oedipus will say, I'm, I'm going to do my job. Abiding at once, he says, my country and the God, not for the sake of friends or near or far, but for mine own will I dispel this curse. For he that slew Laius, whosoever he be, will wish perchance with such a blow to smite me also. In other words, i got to take care of myself. If somebody went after Laius and killed Laius, well then I'm, I'm, I'm culpable. I could myself be killed. i got to find out who this murderer is. I'm going to do this to protect myself, right? Helping him, I help myself. Wow. And then he says it. To, and now, uh, my children, rise with utmost speed from off these steps. I, I'm going to take care of you, right? He says, I will do my task work to the uttermost. And again, the darkest of ironies here. Oedipus says, I will get to the bottom of this if it kills me. Whoa. Of course, the audience wants to shout what Tiresias will say in a few minutes on stage. You're the guy, right? Again, we don't watch the play. The tension of the play is not, gee, I wonder, what, I, I, I wonder what's going to happen next. No, no. We know exactly what's going to happen next. The tension of the play, the conflict of the play, is to watch Oedipus come to realize. We'll ask it 3B, and we'll set you up already. The last time in your life that you did something and you were thoroughly convinced it was the right thing to do and then you found out much much too late it was the totally wrong thing to do or the wrong thing to say that's where Oedipus is headed that's where we as an audience are watching Oedipus go right we have the chorus then who will step up um, they are divided for Sophocles in this play between strophe and antistrophe uh, that is to say two answering parties and the chorus will simply beg for help, right? They've got a bad feeling. If anybody can save us, they figure, it's Oedipus. Why? Because he answered the riddle of the Sphinx. I mean, anybody that can stand up to that Sphinx can clearly figure this one out. I mean, it's a simple problem. Find out who killed Laius, punish that person. Everything's going to be great from here on out, right? Oedipus then will speak with that chorus for a few moments. And he will say it again. The ironies start to just compound, right? He says, That man I banish, whoe'er he be, when he finds the killer of Laius, from out the land whose power and throne are mine. And none may give him shelter, none speak to him, nor join him in prayer and sacrifice, nor pour for him the stream that cleanses guilt. But all shall thrust him from their homes abhorred, our curse and our pollution as the word prophetic of the Pythian God has showed, such as I am, I stand before you here, a helper to the God and to the dead, and for the man who did the guilty deed, whether alone he lurks or leagued with more, I pray that he may waste his life away for vile deeds, vilely dying. And for me, if in my house I knowing it, he dwells, may every curse I speak on my head fall. Now, two things really quickly in your notes. Much has been made in the scholarship and the research about this play. That there seems to be some element of the notion of what we will today understand as the famous idea of the scapegoat. The idea that when something really bad happens, the people all need to be able to blame one person or a group of people sometimes. We think, of course, of the Jews of the Holocaust in Germany don't. And that one person, the scapegoat, will be driven out of their company. The language is clearly here. Oedipus says, when we find out who this guy is, we will destroy him. Why? Because that's the way that the plague is going to be taken care of, and he deserves it. And if this guy is in my house, doesn't matter. I will show no favoritism. Whoever it is, is getting jacked. He continues... And therefore will I strive my best for Laius, the dead king, as if he were my father, and will go all lengths to seek and find the murderer who slew him. Again, this is what we call dramatic on-stage irony. We, the audience, know what the speaker does not know, and of course, because we study our Shakespeare, we know that this is something Shakespeare learned very well from Sophocles, didn't he, right? And of course, it's heartrending to watch someone 
who believes that he is behaving in the appropriate way, knowing full well all he's doing is just getting ready to jack himself, right? Oedipus says, man's best strength must fail to force the gods to do the thing they will not. In other words, I will force the gods' hands on this because Tiresias has been sent for, Tiresias is going to help me out, and I'm going to be able to figure it out. Now, let's put this in our notes. This is a play. We said that Sophocles is a conservative uh, writer. This is no question. This is a play that's going to ask the question about reverence for the gods, right? And here, already, we hear it. Oedipus says, I, will, I, I am willing to force the gods to even tell me how, how this went down. Um, the reverence for the gods will be a huge part of how we will read and understand this play. All right. Now, in a series of dialogues, and ostensibly that's what these plays are, right? Because they are just talking plays, as many plays often are. Certainly on the Greek stage, we have a lot of what we might call action, other ling linguistic action, kind of like what we said about when we pick up the Iliad, we open that, and we see that fight between Agamemnon and Achilles. You have a series of dialogues. Now, it is significant that I would mention that it would be a linguistic altercation like the opening book of the Iliad because we are now going to get Tiresias who shows up. Now, just to remind, I've given lectures on Edith Hamilton's mythology there on LearnStrong.net. You can go find these lectures in full where I talk more at length about this really famous character named Tiresias. If you know your King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table story, you know about Merlin. Merlin is, of course, prototypic of Tiresias. Who is Tiresias? Well, let's say two or three things about him. In his storyline, it's fascinating. He's walking along the road. He sees two snakes hooking up. He says, get out of here. And he hits them or kicks them with his, with his stick or he kicks them to, to bust them up. Hera, the queen goddess, doesn't like it. And so she changes him into a woman for seven years. And then he's, he's allowed to become a man again. What's significant, though, is that he can remember the life of both being a woman as well as being a man. We're also told in another story that he got a chance to see the goddess Athena while she was naked taking a bath. She caught him and she blinds him for the rest of his life. So what is it that makes uh, Tiresias special? Let's write it down, three things. One, well, first of all, he's lived the life of both a man and a woman, so he remembers both lives. Unlike men who have no clue how women live and think, and unlike women who have no clue how men live and think, Tiresias knows both. Number two, he's blind which means he doesn't have sight, but he has the gift of prophecy. So in other words, he can kind of tell you things about the future, which of course is why he's brought in, but he can also tell you things about the past. Number three, very much like Cassandra, Tiresias often is not listened to until it's too late. Okay, We're going to see this in this play. We're also going to see this in the, uh, in the play Antigone. Tiresias is going to come in and he's going to tell Oedipus enough information so that Oedipus can know that it's he, he, he in fact is the guilty man. But he won't believe it. He doesn't want to listen to it. Tiresias sits kind of like between humans and the gods. In some ways, therefore, he's kind of like an oracle of a kind. And he's going to tell Oedipus what Oedipus probably doesn't necessarily want to know, but he says that he wants to know. All right, how's this set up? Well, the first thing is uh, Oedipus, and he will say to Tiresias, hey, i got to have your help here. you got to tell me some stuff. Save the city. Save thyself. Save me. Lift off the guilt that death has left behind on thee. We hang. To you, the ironies are dark. Jacusta will hang herself at the end of the play. To use our means, our power in doing good, as noble a service owned. In other words, he says, hey, I really need your help here, Tiresias. I need you to tell me. I need you to save me. Save the city. Tiresias doesn't want to tell, and in fact, Tiresias says, how sad is wisdom's gift when no good issue waiteth on the wise, right? He says, right, well, I knew this, but an evil hour forgot, alas, or else I had not come. In other words, oh, man, I do not want to tell you what I have to tell you. I'm not going to say anything. The irony is he says, I'm not going to say anything, and then, of course, he ends up saying a lot. Why? Because Oedipus treats him with total disrespect, makes fun of him for being blind, comments on his inability to uh, tell the truth and be a liar. And then finally he suggests that maybe what's really going on here is that um, he and Creon are in this together, which ultimately will leave uh, Tiresias to tell him the truth. Tiresias uh, will finally say it to Oedipus 
when he makes Oedipus, when he makes Tiresias mad enough, Tiresias says, all right, fine, 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 let me tell you then what's really going on here. There lives not man, he says, who wastes his life more wretchedly than you. He's speaking directly to Oedipus, right? And Oedipus uh, says, ironically, a curse light on thee. The use of the word light in our translation here is significant because light and darkness will be one of the major motifs of the play. Sight and blindness versus knowledge and perspicacity and all of that, as we'll talk about in a bit, right? And then you have the exchange. Um, Tiresias says, uh, We then for thee, uh, so deemest thou, are fools, but for thy parents who begot thee, wise. In other words, uh, he turns to go and he says, Oh, by the way, what's the... the who are, who are your parents? Who are your real parents? And, you know, Oedipus is like, what, what, what? What's that about? What's that about? What are you talking about, right? Oedipus says, stay. What mortal gave me birth? Uh, Tiresias says, this day shall give thy birth and work thy doom. In other words, you're about to find some stuff out you don't want to know. Oedipus says, what riddles dark and dim thou lovest to speak? Now, the word riddle here, of course, is significant because this is a play about riddles and confusion. We got all kinds of riddles. Of course, we got the riddle of, uh, again, the riddle of the Sphinx we've already, already mentioned, but we got other kind of riddles as well, like who is Odysseus and all, or, uh, I'm sorry, who is Oedipus and all of that, right? Um, yeah, Tiresias says, they are riddles, but thy skill exceeds in solving much. In other, in, in other words, he says, y y you were able to solve the riddle of the Sphinx. You'll be able to figure this one out as well. So, uh, Oedipus says, scoff is thy wealth. In this, thou found me strong. In other words, I'm not going to take your garbage. Um, Oedipus is a guy who can lose his temper very quickly, and he considers that strength. In this play, you got all these turnabouts, right? So, for example, strength is actually weakness, right? Blindness is actually sunny. Oedipus, uh, Tiresias says, and yet success in this has worked thy fall. In other words, the information I'm going to share with you will lead to your own fall. Are you sure and again, this notion of the tragic fall, the hamartia is all there, right? Do you, are you sure you really want to hear this, right? Oedipus says it, though. I little care if I have saved 